Wes Craven gave the horror genre one of its greatest icons when he introduced Freddy Krueger in 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street, but he had very little to do with what happened to Freddy after that. As his character's story continued, Craven had zero creative control over the Nightmare series, aside from when he co-wrote the third film, and of course when he wrote and directed the seventh film in 1994, Wes Craven's New Nightmare. But he didn't see much money from them. As he told Fangoria, creating Freddy gave him great credibility, but not a great payday. Enter Alive Films. The brainchild of legendary rock manager Shep Gordon, Alice Cooper's famous manager who was immortalized in the Mike Myers documentary Supermensch. The company, which had a distribution deal with Universal Pictures, was keen to churn out a series of low-cost horror films with the added benefit that the horror directors they signed would have creative control. John Carpenter made two films for them, They Live and Prince of Darkness, so that explains the Alice Cooper cameo in the later. Alive approached Craven with the idea being that he would create a new horror franchise that he would have creative control over and a financial stake in. Needless to say, he jumped at the chance. Alive gave him complete creative freedom and he gave them Shocker, mixing ideas from some of his previous films like A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Last House on the Left, and elements inspired by the likes of movies that he didn't direct, The Hidden and The Thing, along with the desire to examine television's place in the heart of modern culture this being 1989, by creating a character who can travel through TV land. Shocker was supposed to give us a new genre icon, jumpstart a franchise, and earn Craven stacks of cash. Instead, it had a mediocre run at the box office and never received a follow-up of any kind. So, what the fuck happened to this horror movie? Looking back at the production and 1989 release of Shocker, it's obvious that the legacy of Craven's earlier creation, Freddy Krueger, was hanging over this project like a cloud. It's almost like the movie was made as a challenge to Freddy. Set reports and interviews conducted at the time were packed with references to the character. For example, one article said Craven was aiming to build a better Freddy. And in the making of featurette, Craven straight out said the villain in this film was designed to retire Freddy and was much more exciting than Freddy. The concept originated as a TV series idea that Craven had pitched to Fox, and the title of the series he wanted to make was The Dream Stalker, which is how Freddy is often described. The Dream Stalker would have been a fitting title for the film up to this point. The story is set in Maryville, which Craven intended to be his home state of Ohio, but it was filmed in the Los Angeles area and never feels like anywhere other than LA. Even though the production went through the trouble of putting Ohio license plates on all the vehicles, they didn't bother hiding the palm trees in the background with some of the locations. When the film begins, Maryville residents are living in terror because their city has been the site of a nine-month killing spree carried out by the family slasher, a maniac who has battered his way through locked doors to slaughter entire families claiming nearly 30 victims. Police are baffled and the crime might have never been solved if it wasn't for local college football player Jonathan Parker, who develops a psychic connection to the family slasher. Through his nightmares, Jonathan is able to witness these crimes before they even happen. The images he sees eventually allow him to deduce that the family slasher is TV repairman Horace Pinker. Using his dreams as a guide, Jonathan helps the police apprehend the killer. Now, musician Mick Fleetwood of Fleetwood Mac recently had taken on an acting role in the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie The Running Man, and he auditioned to play Pinker, but the character who was supposed to replace Freddy in our hearts and mind didn't end up going to Mick Fleetwood. Instead, the character ended up being played by Mitch Pileggi. Pileggi would of course go on to play Walter Skinner on nearly 100 episodes of The X-Files, but at the time he was an unknown, and he turned out to be the perfect choice. He really shines in the scenes he has in the first 45 minutes. Now, no explanation is given for Pinker's madness. No mythology is built up around him. The guy is just a violent, sleazy scumbag. It's not hard to imagine him plotting to commit sex crime in a century with Krug and the gang from Last House on the Left. We never find out why he decided to wipe out entire families, but we do learn that he had a family of his own once that he beat relentlessly. Until the day his seven-year-old son shot him in the knee, giving him a permanent limp, he terrorized him. Pileggi turns in an incredible, intimidating, unnerving performance as Pinker in those first 45 minutes. Then Shocker earns his title by executing Pinker in the electric chair and turning him into a supernatural slash electrical force that can travel through bodies and appliances. From then on, he's kind of a joke. The character turns into a quit machine for the second half of the film. His offer to take Jonathan on a joyride in his Volkswagen is one of the all-time worst groan-inducing one-liners. 
He was scary when he was flesh and blood, but when he gains supernatural abilities, he does things like transform into a viable matic recliner and chant, I think I can, I think I can, while elongating his fingers and fingernails so that he can plug himself into an outlet. It's unfortunate. It took Freddy a few sequels to become overly comedic, but Pinker gets there all within his first movie. Between Pinker's execution and the point in the film where he starts jumping between TV channels, he possesses the bodies of several people, giving some other actors a chance to play the character. Vincent Guastafaro of Jason Lives, Michael Murphy, Alice Cooper's guitarist Kane Roberts, Jan Peters, Dendry Taylor, Sam Scarver, and even Craven's son, Jonathan, all get on the act. But the standout of the bunch is Lindsay Parker, who was nine years old when the film was released, as a little girl who develops a nasty disposition and a foul mouth when Pinker briefly takes control of her. One thing that becomes quite obvious when Pinker is possessing people who have guns is that the guy is a lousy shot. It's no wonder he chose to use a knife when he was committing his family slasher murders. Once again, it's up to Jonathan Parker to stop Pinker, and along the way he finds out that he has the psychic connection to the killer because he is Pinker's long-lost son, the same kid who shot him in the knee. Jonathan is played by Peter Berg, who doesn't look anything like Mitch Pelletti. These days, of course, Berg is primarily known as a director, with his credits including Friday Night Lights, Hancock, Battleship, Lone Survivor, and the recent Spencer Confidential. And I have to say, he's a solid actor as well, and was kind of a matinee idol at these times. A hip, young, up-and-coming actor. He made his character a likable person, and is capable of bringing some impressive intensity to some of his scenes. Jonathan is easy to root for as he dedicates himself to taking Pinker down, whether he's a slasher or an electric ghost, and lucky for him, his girlfriend Allison is so special that she's even able to give him assistance from beyond the grave after Pinker kills her. It could be one of the reasons why Shocker didn't catch on with the larger audience, because a slasher that doesn't follow standard formula and doesn't feature much in the way of usual slasher movie cliches is a tough slasher for audiences to root for. The biggest cliche here is the presence of a wisecracking killer. Beyond that, there are no instances of sex including death, there isn't even any gratuitous nudity, not even when Alice in the scene taking her bath, and it kills off the character that you expect to be the final girl, with Peter Berg instead being kind of the final boy. Allison is the lead female, even though she also claims to have a chaste relationship with her boyfriend, which doesn't seem likely given that he's a dreamy college athlete who rents his own place and they've been dating on and off for a year. She still gets killed by Pinker about 25 minutes in. Allison was played by Kenny Cooper, and Craven and Cooper were clearly endeavoring to give the character an ethereal quality during her early scenes. Mainly, they tried to do this by having her whisper nearly every line she says. Even when she talks on the phone, she whispers. It's kind of irritating. Allison is one of several people killed by Pinker over the course of the film, but this also happens to be a slasher movie that doesn't revel in the kills. Hmm, now this is a bit of a problem. I mean, who likes their filth this clean? The Shocker doesn't even use his ability to manipulate electricity to kill many people. Most of the deaths are bloody slashings. We usually just see the aftermaths. That's partially due to the way the death scenes were shot in the first place, but Craven also had trouble securing an R rating from the MPAA on this one, and some gore effects had to be removed. All in all, the MPA demanded that 13 changes be made throughout the film so that they would give Craven the R. And it's all rather tame. Craven seemed to be having a great time during the production of the movie, especially since he was working with his largest budget to date, but there were some bumps in the road during post-production. The trouble with the MPAA was one bump, and another came when the cheaper method they were planning to use for the film's special effects fell through and they had to spend three times as much as they intended on special effects that had to be thrown together in just two weeks. Craven was never happy with how those effects turned out, and in the days when he was producing remakes of The Hills Have Eyes and The Last House on the Left, he was also talking about remaking Shocker mainly just to have the chance to tell the story with better effects. But even though the effects in the film look silly at times, they're still fitting for the mind-boggling scenes they're featured in. Craven was also uncertain about the rock soundtrack, which was a sign of the involvement of executive producer Shep Gordon of the live films, who of course managed Alice Cooper. While Craven may have felt that an orchestral score would have worked better for some scenes, the film's fans loved the soundtrack and had a lot of fun rocking out to the likes of Megadeth, Dangerous Toys, Bonfire, Iggy Pop, Dead On, and the Dudes of Wrath while watching Horace Pinker do his thing. The most likely reason why Shocker only developed a cult following instead of becoming a big hit is the fact that the story jumps around all over the place and the film is extremely inconsistent in tone. What starts off as a promisingly chilling slasher goes off the rails and becomes an insane live-action cartoon. Those first 45 minutes are very dark, and yet a goofy-looking strangled corpse scene early on serves as a warning sign for the silliness that lies ahead. A villain who starts off frightening and repulsive ends up chasing the hero through an episode of Leave it to Beaver. On the audio commentary, Craven admits that he was seeing the world in a different way when he was making this movie because he was going through a rough divorce and it gave him a dark sense of humor. At one point, he wonders aloud if he made it too whimsical. 
possibly. Shocker reached theater screens on October 27, 1989, just in time for Halloween, and just two months after the release of the latest Nightmare on Elm Street movie that Craven had nothing to do with, The Dream Child. In the end, the icon the film had challenged, the one whose success Craven was chasing, beat Horrid's Pinker at the box office. Shocker's domestic total was only $16.5 million, and the fifth Freddy movie, despite scathing reviews, made over $22 million. That's less than half of what the previous Elm Street movie had made a year before, showing that Freddy was kind of on his way down the drain, but it was still enough to overcome Horace Pinker. While Shocker wasn't successful enough at the box office to kick off the franchise it was supposed to lead to, and the live films didn't last much longer as a company, it's tough to feel cheated by the lack of sequels. Are they really necessary when Pinker already goes through multiple movies' worth of changes? In this one's 109 minutes. Shocker quickly developed a solid cult following, but some checking it out for the first time more than 30 years down the line will have to accept the issues that fans see as part of its charm. The film is a mishmash of ideas that doesn't really hold together. The fluctuating tone and the ridiculousness of it all earns the film a place in the heart of some viewers while repelling others. For audience members who find Shocker's scattered ideas and tonal shifts to be off-putting, the movie is a mess and it has been ever since it was released. But if a viewer can appreciate the craziness it has to offer and overlook the dodgy effects, it's just as entertaining now as it was in 1989. For Joe Blowhorn, I'm Chris Bumbray.